welcome to this video about ancient Egypt, uh, the land of pretty predictable rivers, gods, and a largely lonely kingdom. You'll see what all that means in just a second. Now again, the goal for these overviews is just to give you a quick picture of all this stuff. Clearly, it's just the major themes. It's just identification and description level information. You're going to be missing details. You're going to be missing specific people, places, and things, and missing a timeline of events, which we'll get to later. So to begin, here's the biggest of big pictures, not just of place, but also of time. Here is today, like modern day area. Here's population density. So here's Egypt. The darker regions means it's more dense. Look at how many people live along this area. I wonder what's in that area, you might say. Why? It's the river Nile. It's the Nile River. So the population density of these areas largely reflects, uh, in this ancient time, the place where people could get water and have agriculture. And early on, the Sahara Desert was not a desert because of different uh, rainfall patterns that were available at the time. So early on, Egypt, it was not this nice when they started settling down in the Nile River Delta area, but it was at least a lot greener when Egypt was first getting going. And over time, the desert closed in around the folks who were living in Egypt, and it made it so that they could really only live along this river area, but lots and lots of people were compressed into that one area. And that uh, kept them isolated from the folks around them. But it also allowed them to really develop on their own and develop a very unified state, which we'll talk more about in just a minute. And I'm going to click out of this PowerPoint here just to show you this huge map, this huge and beautiful map, which I will uh, reference in the description. But you can see here there's an area called Lower Egypt, which is up near the Mediterranean Sea up here, and then Mesopotamia is off in this direction. My mouse is going to the right there. Uh, and you can see there are cities, but all of them were all along this one green area where you could use the water for agriculture. Notice this area is called Lower Egypt. Even though it's to the north, that's because it's lower down on the river. So the river flows north, and so this is technically Lower Egypt. And then up here is Upper Egypt because it's further up river. Here's the Red Sea you can see over here. And then here's this area called Kush. And we're actually going to talk more about other African civilizations in uh, later lessons. But you can see that there are a variety of areas to begin with. Now back to the PowerPoint. You can see on this green map, this is right where we're talking about. So it's in the northern part of Africa here, but right close to the Fertile Crescent. Now, in terms of local geography, uh, it was a really narrow, fertile area, and the Egyptians called that area the Black Land because it had all this really fertile soil that you can see this example of here. And the reason it was fertile is because the Nile flooded super on time every year in September and left this dark soil behind. Again, this silt, which is a mineral-rich soil that plants really enjoy growing in. Um, and that made agriculture really reliable in Egypt. Uh, very much so more reliable than in Mesopotamia. And what we see in the development of Egyptian civilization is there were fewer cities and far more villages than Mesopotamia. But some of that might be a little bit to do with what we have left in the archaeological record. Uh, but in general, there were fewer cities and more villages. And they also had access to basically all the resources that they needed to build their civilization, including the food, the lumber, the metals, within relatively easy reach. And so they were very self-sufficient as compared to Mesopotamia, as in they got along just about fine on their own, so they're a little more isolated. And then also because they were kept apart from the rest of the world, when you were living in Egypt, you were relatively safe from the dangers of like invading armies and things like that. Not like it didn't happen, but it was much rarer than uh, happened in Mesopotamia. So here are some social patterns that developed as a result. They had a reliable river, and they had a lot more reliability in terms of their gods. And here's a really great uh, hieroglyphic set picture of all of these gods like this. Um, and we'll talk more about the individual ones in the future. But again, this is a polytheistic system. They had lots of different gods. And lots of them started off as local gods, became national gods once they were part of you know, a single kingdom and things like that. But they were also a lot less strict in their social ca class system. Not like they didn't have it, not like there wasn't a division of power, but they at least were less strict than in Mesopotamia. You had at the top the most strict kind of class element, which is a god king. A person who is not just a human being, but is a god on earth. Priests, nobles, and other folks below that. Uh, I don't say him here because there were female pharaohs. Um, 
And then you had scribes and craftspeople below them. And then you had farmers, servants, and slaves all the way down to the bottom. Now, slavery was very limited in Egypt, despite what you may have heard before. Um, and again, it's if you were uh, convicted of a crime, if you were captured in a war, or if you were a debtor, you could potentially become enslaved. Uh, also notable in Egypt is this really strong belief in an afterlife. And you can see that in the tombs that people built. And tombs also often reflected the social class that you were in. And you can see that in a lot of our archaeological evidence. And you'll notice in a lot of Egypt, we have archaeological evidence going back a long time, both in terms of the record in Egypt itself back in their time, and also people have been digging stuff up in Egypt to discover what happened there in the past for a long time. So the, how long we have been paying attention to their ancient stuff, it goes back a pretty long ways. So here are some key political patterns. The whole area of Egypt, like you saw in that map there, Upper and Lower Egypt, were united under a pharaoh way far back in time who is sometimes called Menes. Maybe it's Narmer. We have some archaeological evidence with that name. But you can see what happened, which is kind of cool. Uh, there was a crown of one half of Egypt and a crown of the other half of Egypt. And then if you conquered both of them, like maybe those folks did, you got to wear a double hat. That's pretty cool. Uh, also, a thing notable here is the contrast between kingdom and empire. So when you put Upper and Lower Egypt together, they're under a single culture by and large, and so they get called a single kingdom, where everyone within that political organization owes direct allegiance to this single ruler, the pharaoh. And remember, the pharaoh is much more powerful than kings were in Mesopotamia. Uh, but what's a little bit different is Egypt would go beyond that and actually establish a thing called an empire by subjugating, which means taking control of other kingdoms and then ruling over them, sometimes through a uh, like local king who would then owe allegiance to the Egyptian pharaoh. Uh, so there's a difference between king, kingdom and empire, and it's, it's that empires rule over potentially more than one kingdom or a kingdom and some other smaller areas. Now, the kings that were called pharaohs, they ruled as gods, and they had a very important spiritual role of protecting the, the you know, souls and spirits of their people. And they did have a dynastic system of power transfer. So they, they transferred their power to people in their family, following very specific rules. And often it went down through the generations. Now, the state was pretty powerful in Egypt. There wasn't a lot of other places to go. You couldn't just run off into the desert and likely survive. So the state had a lot of power and they demanded largely labor um, and taxes, but labor because they would use that labor of all the people who weren't currently working on a farm to build canals, to build farm infrastructure, like uh, irrigation ditches and things like that. And also tombs, you know, the pyramids and stuff. And it took a lot of labor to do, so it shows the power of the centralized state in Egypt. They, too, had a very centralized state. Now, the, and in fact, way more centralized than, than Mesopotamian states at the time. Uh, there was tension between pharaohs and bureaucrats, however. When I say bureaucrats, I mean, like, the people who are the advisors and the organizers, the pencil pushers, you know, uh, the people who, who do a lot of the paperwork. Those bureaucrats often tried to pull more power towards themselves. And then uh, Egyptian pharaohs would then pull back and try to have more of the power and try and centralize more. And this tension plays out over time throughout Egypt's history. Also, the temples and priesthoods were very powerful. And there was not often a lot of tension between pharaohs and the priesthoods, as far as we're aware. But there's some very specific examples of that, which we will study in more depth later. Economically, their main sources of food were fish, wheat, chickpeas, uh, domesticated meat, so like, you know, like cows they had, and also goats and things like that. Um, because they had a reliable flood and this very, very centralized government, uh, they had massive agricultural surplus, and they were able to use that to trade for the few things that they didn't have direct access to, uh, like the stuff they needed to make bronze and also for cedar, wood, and things to build ships and use in, in construction materials, and also gold and other things from further south in Africa. Um, they used papyrus reeds to make paper, which you can see right here. Oh, and by the way, this is a use of a plow up here, and this is uh, depictions of barley, which they also used to make beer. Um, but then down here is making papyrus. Here's the reeds. Here's a guy making a, a mat out of the reeds, and then they pound it flat into stuff that is a, a kind of paper. And 
again, because they had access to all of these resources, they were more self-sufficient. They didn't, they didn't really need a lot of other people. So they were a little, they were more isolated as a kingdom. And then here's again, the importance of their writing and what they left behind. Hieroglyphics is a term for the early pictogram style writing that Egyptians used. And here that is down here in the very bottom. But later with the papyrus, they developed a script that was a lot easier to write. You can see how much easier it'd be to write these things, these you know, quick lines and scribbles as composed, compared to uh, organizing all of these individual pictures. So that's one important thing to know. They had multiple ways of writing. But also, here's why we know that. We only really know this because we found a stone that had ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics on it and their script and Greek, which we already knew how to translate. And that allowed us to translate all the way back here. So one of the reasons we know so much about Egypt is because we can translate all of their writing. Um, and what we found was a really rich literary history, like tales of adventure, magic, po love poetry, uh, hymns, and some very specific technical writing, which is always beautiful for historians because we're nerds. Uh, but then also they left behind lots of tombs and mummies, and that got people very excited in the 1800s. And so we got a lot of archaeological work back then that's like slightly questionable, but uh, it's fine. And we'll talk more about that. And what's missing, though, is we don't actually know really clear answers to some things that people would really like to know. Like how exactly did they get those massive stones up onto the pyramids? We have answers, but not final and definitive answers. Here's some examples of different kinds of ramps. They would have built those out of just like packed earth that they might've used to get the stones up on top of the pyramids. But these are suggestions. Um, but also we don't have a great record of their early myths and like long drawn out stories of their myths the way we do have in Mesopotamia. Um, again, we're also missing the records of what the average person thought and the you know records of peasants because they could not write and they did not write stuff down. Uh, and we have mostly elite men's voices because they were the people who were uh, largely having things written for themselves and tombs created. But we do have more women's voices in Egypt than we did in Mesopotamia because Mesopotamia was a very patriarchal uh, society as compared to Egypt where some women had more power. Uh, so that is our video on Egypt. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye. -bye.